Welcome to Augmenting Native Cloud Security Services to Achieve Enterprise-Grade Security. I'm Christopher Hertz, VP of Cloud Security Sales for Rapid7, and I'm joined by Chris Dramas. Chris, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Chris. Um, VP of Technology here at Rapid7. Um, work hand-in-hand -hand with engineering as well as product support to just continue evolving our cloud security offering. Well, thanks for joining me, Chris. It'll be easy for people to remember who we are, Chris and Chris, Chris Squared. Um, my background is really a decade or more in, in cloud transformation with customers helping them adopt cloud securely. And today, Chris and I are going to talk really about um, how to help companies achieve the security achievement gap uh, using cloud native security tools from AWS, Azure, GCP, uh, augmented with tools like Divi Cloud by Rapid7. Um, I want to first talk and just sort of set the table initially, and then Chris and I are going to have a, a conversation really around um, all the things that you can do with cloud native security tools and how you can augment them. But the first is to say that, look, for most of our customers that we're working with and many of the companies we're interacting with, uh, they are adopting uh, cloud services and container services very rapidly. Um, and they're doing so to drive innovation. Uh, and that innovation is because it's easy to experiment in cloud services. It's uh, easy for developers and analysts and engineers to be able to have self-service access to all these cloud services, to be able to create new applications or, or really update existing applications in the cloud um, and to do so in an agile way that really allows people to double down on successes quickly or fail inexpensively. Um, and that really means that it, when someone is trying to drive innovation, cloud is really the first choice of, of how to do that as a platform. What that means is technology innovation is really going growing quickly, right? And, and, not, and not only is the technology innovation being adopted very quickly, just the complexity of that innovation is, is changing, that technology is changing. Because these cloud services are constantly shifting themselves. They're constantly new services that are being, being created and, and released by the cloud service providers. And the amount of time it, it's required to um, adopt those is shrinking because it, increasingly companies need to be competitive in order to be successful and, and stay alive. And then layer on top of all that is the unplanned digital and workforce disruption that we are all experiencing right now due to COVID-19. Um, uh, and so what that created is really this three-dimensional risk that's created by the pace of innovation and disruption that many of the companies we interact with are having a hard time solving for. Um, and so that created what we think of as a security achievement gap, which is this gap between what you're able to manage sort of traditionally and what you have to manage now in this new world order. Uh, and that's really uh, challenging. And we're going to talk about that uh, as we go through because Really, that's manifested on how to solve for that is through using native tools and, and augmenting with things like Divi Cloud. Um, but let's first talk about really who has responsibility for cloud security. No one, um, uh, you know, when we're thinking about this, people need to think about the shared responsibility model, uh, where really it's important for companies to understand that AWS and Microsoft and Google, they're going to secure their equation, right? They're going to secure the data centers and they're going to secure the underlying infrastructure that you're using. But the cloud service itself is quite configurable, and that configurability actually is, is a double-edged sword. It gives you a lot of flexibility to use that, that service, but it also means it can be configured in ways that are not necessarily secure or compliant relative to the context of how you might deploy an application. Um, and so folks like Gartner have really pointed out that by 2025, 99% of cloud security failures will be the customer's fault. And so, again, these cloud service providers like AWS, Microsoft, and Azure uh, and Google, they all want you to leverage their tools to help solve for that gap. Um, and so we're going to talk through some of that. Uh, the other thing to, to mention as part of the setting the table is really that the cyber attacks that take advantage of cloud misconfigurations and cloud and, and sort of operational security risks are, are increasing and they're quite large. So through from 2018 to 2019, there was a 42% increase in major cloud misconfiguration breaches. Uh, from 81 to 115, and we estimate that across 2018 and 2019 alone, um, misconfigurations caused close to $5 trillion in damages for, for the company. So huge amount of, of cost and, and opportunity here. So let me talk a little bit, let me turn over to my, my partner in crime, Chris, and say, so one of the challenges we see is that 42% uh, of IT professionals surveyed did not know which framework their company used to maintain compliance. And, and why are frameworks something we should be thinking about, Chris, in, in your opinion, as we, we look at these things? Yeah, that's a great question. Frameworks are you know, a fantastic place to start. You know, you've got um, cloud-focused frameworks like the CIS benchmarks. Um, you've got up-and-coming up and frameworks like the uh, Cloud Security Alliance uh, CCM, 
Um, and they really take um, a, a lot of the cloud technology, they do the heavy lifting for you to show you just the top attack areas and where you should lock, you know, lock down. Yeah. Um, you know, these, these really give you the blueprint on how to secure you know, things like compute, storage, networking, and, and you know, just best practice ways. But you know, really, they're just scratching the surface. And you know, when, when you look at things like you know, NIST 853, or you know NIST CSF, very comprehensive frameworks that are very mature. They've been they've been around for a while, and they contain, you know, in some cases, hundreds of of checks. Now they they can be challenging because some of these actually predate cloud in terms of when they were authored. And so there is an exercise where you have to sort of decipher, you know, what did PCI really mean, uh, you know, when it was written in the data center days? How does that translate to cloud, you know? Yeah. And, all of this, you know, software-defined networking that come comes with it, and I think that that's that's really where folks can struggle is kind of which framework do I start with? Um, you know, really recommend this Inter 53 and then CSA CCM as a starting point. The great thing about you know the the cloud configuration matrix is that it actually gives you the analog of what that control would be across things like HIPAA, PCI, as well as NIST. So if you're aligning around that, it's very easy to map to different frameworks that your auditors will want. And I think one of the key elements that, that we always call out is the fact that actually developers now are really first class citizens in security, right, in, in the cloud. Because in many ways, developers are the ones who are, um, are responsible now for cloud. And so, it, you know, but yeah, the interesting thing is we saw that half of all respondents said that, uh, that responded to our 2020 State of Enterprise Cloud and Container Adoption Security Report a survey. Uh, said that their developers and engineers at times ignore or circumvent cloud security and compliance policies. And so it's, you know, first we see customers often have a, and companies have a challenge with not knowing which frameworks to use and then communicating that effectively to their teams. But even beyond that, there are folks who just simply circumvent the security policies, even if they know the framework, largely because in many cases, they're just trying to move very quickly. They're not malicious, they're not, or they simply don't know what they, they how to apply that. And that I think gets to, this is when why you need to use native security controls, right? Which is that you have you know an unawareness of frameworks, and you have developers and engineers who are under so much pressure to get their job done, and are now have to be participating in the security process. And too often mistakes are made, and so you do need native service provider security controls that can help you not just look at things like misconfigurations, but more on like how to actually know when you have a vulnerability or when you have threats, or when there's a managed uh, sort of data security, data privacy issue. Um, so, you know, we've, we've sort of called out three here uh, in the AWS world, guard duty for threat detection, Macy for managed data security, and inspector for vulnerability scanning. But actually, there's a whole wide world of native controls that have, in many cases, parity across uh, all three major providers. Chris, do you want to maybe just riff for a little while on some of the ones that you see customers maybe unaware of, um, just sort of a, at a top level, maybe just let's use AWS as the analog for this, just to say which ones from AWS, and then obviously the, the, the sort of the, 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 uh, there's, there's the options there with an Azure and GCP as well. Absolutely. So AWS config is kind of where I would definitely start with. I mean, that, that's going to give you really great out-of-the-box controls around things like S3, Lambda, EC2, RDS, a lot of the common use services um, within, within AWS. You get great checks, things for public access, you know, preventing un unencrypted resources from, from being deployed, misconfigured, you know, networking, routing, and security groups coming through. Um, also, things like the um, web application firewall, fantastic layer seven prevention, uh, and for the for the price, I mean, you really get amazing value even at enterprise scale. Uh, and then the CloudWatch CloudTrail um, combination, I think, is really compelling. You know, you can use CloudWatch uh, to get real time alerting when certain events propagate, things like somebody changing a S3 bucket policy, or allowing a security group to, you know have SSH come through. These are events you really want to keep an eye on because they're the misconfigurations that, that add up to that large number you saw Chris talking about before. And it's it's very easy to overlook these. And with just a few simple clicks in the Amazon console, you can set up nice alerting uh, that is just pennies on the dollar relative to the protections that you're getting. Um, and that, that definitely protects you. And then you've got the analog across. And so Azure and Google have implemented very similar services and you're able to set up similar approaches there yeah and let's talk a little bit I, I, let's talk maybe 
vulnerability scanning for something with something like Inspector. I know, mm -hmm. you know that's an area where you've talked a lot about something like Inspector. Um, do you want to dive in a little bit maybe there on, on how that's useful and, and, and folks can leverage that very effectively? Absolutely. Um, so look, misconfigurations are only part of the puzzle when it comes to you know leaking access to your resources. Um, a lot of your sensitive data can get exposed through a misconfigured compute instance where somebody can remotely exploit a vulnerability on it, get access to that, and then use an associated IAM role that's uh, you know attached to the instance to then start walking your Amazon cloud accounts. Uh, we saw this happen last year. And, and, and so protecting your EC2 instances, which really oftentimes have overly permissive IAM roles associated with them is extremely important in, in today's world. I mean, IAM has effectively become the new perimeter. And if it's misconfigured, the cost of that misconfiguration can be just to, to the moon. And so thinking about securing your compute, you wanna make sure that you have hardened AMIs that do not have critical or high alerts, things like zero day you know, exploits, remote SSH exploits. Um, you know, these, these exploits and attack vectors are evolving daily. Yeah. And so being able to do host-based scanning on all of your compute instances is, is vital uh, to success because if you have a misconfiguration to your EC2 instance and there is open you know, SSH access, that's, that's bad in and of itself. But if it has a vulnerable version of SSH, you're much more likely to get compromised yeah. in the amount of time that it would take you to remediate. And, and the other part of it we see is things like Macy, where initially when Macy was deployed, and for those who aren't familiar, it's an Amazon service that really looks at um, protecting data. It was actually a little bit challenging to deploy and quite expensive to deploy for many customers. Um, but you know, just like all cloud services, these things evolve quickly. And yep. Uh, Amazon just re sort of updated Macy, making it much more accessible and affordable. So the other part is you need to constantly reevaluate these. But again, why would you use these native CSP controls? Well, you would use them in a variety of ways, right? Again, you can see it on the left hand here, audit logging, service catalog, monitoring, DDoS protection, web app firewall, key management, optimization, threat detection, resource monitoring, vulnerability scanning, deployment, secret management. By the way, there's more than this. We just put together a quick sample, but all of these, you know, these are all native capabilities that are that are pretty darn accessible and can essentially help overcome some of the challenges you might normally see in cloud, especially as you democratize access across many folks, right? So at scale, you know, in cloud with self-service access with a whole population of people who don't necessarily know frameworks, don't necessarily know, you know how to how to be part of the security process or still learning. Well, this is why you need to have all these different elements arrayed. Um, and why that it's useful to go with the native controls is that often they're best in class, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it is, you, know, you think about something like um, a, um, a guard duty, for example, for, for threat detection, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Chris, but I think the, you know, Amazon doesn't expose the DNS logs, is my recollection, to really any third party, but they do use them to essentially drive some of the threat detection and guard duty. So they have access to data that others don't. They're using machine learning and AI that's been trained across the breadth of their entire environment. Um, and so these are really best in class capabilities that you should be leveraging throughout. Um, the challenge really comes to, well, when, when do you need to augment those? And so again, we see this really as a, you know, the CSP security controls really should be addressing audit, visibility, protection, detection, and automation requirements, but they do that to a point. And we see this, this relationship where, you know, as in more simple environments, as you manage risk, the CSP tools, the native tools by themselves are actually quite good, right? They, they solve a lot of the risk profile. But then as you increase complexity, and by the way, that goes to sort of multi-account complexity, that goes to service complexity, even within a single cloud service provider. It can go to sort of just the scale of complexity. The more people using it, the broader, you know, again, as that, that complexity increases, and that can go to multi-cloud as well, as you start to bridge across multiple clouds. Well, the security CSP, actually the, the curve goes back up above, above the risk appetite because it actually becomes quite challenging to try and manage all these uh, components at scale. And it might be useful, Chris, to talk about that, just some of those sort of simple things, like maybe, you know, look, if I'm a malicious person, and I get in somehow get get access. The first thing I might do is is turn off CloudTrail, mm -hmm. um, or if I'm someone who just doesn't know any better, I've just spun up a new environment and I don't turn CloudTrail on, right? But that's sort of the basics. And so something like Divi Cloud allows augmentation where we can detect 
that cloud trail is, is either not turned on for whatever reason, either it wasn't turned on in the beginning, it actually turned on as part of that policy. Um, and so it, it, you know, a simple example, but do you want to sort of talk a little bit about how, how do you see that, that, that challenge with scale uh, relative to the cloud, native cloud security tools? And then we can talk at the next slide really about how we help, you know, how, how we help us solve that. Absolutely. Um, look, you, you know, Amazon and the cloud providers themselves are all getting better at giving you a single point to go turn the stuff on across your entire fleet of accounts, but it's not there across the board yet. And not all enterprises as, as well as small to mid market customers have adopted that yet. And so you're dealing with these accounts independently, potentially across different BUs who have their own top level payer accounts. And there's no guarantees that these things are going to be on consistently with service control policies to lock down the tampering. So you always have the risk of a malicious actor getting into that account, turning off your audit and tracking capabilities, and then doing whatever they need to, using third party out of the you know out of band automation, whether it's through Jivy Cloud, open source tooling, or other commercial vendors. You need to have something to double up on your checks to make sure that this stuff gets flipped back on when it is turned off and done so in real time you know this has to be done within hopefully seconds but worst case a couple minutes before you're able to flip that back into a good state um and you know sometimes these services while they are best in class there is a pick and choose element to it because you do reach a point in scale where while these are all affordable independently when you aggregate them together it can become somewhat costly to do this across hundreds or worst case thousands of cloud accounts you heard chris talk about it before the scale that we see oftentimes isn't just a multi-cloud scale problem it's because customers wind up inheriting hundreds or thousands of cloud accounts we've talked to many customers who are well past 4,000 amazon accounts and that just becomes a bit more costly and just harder to track and so that, that's where i think there's this augmentation where we you should always yeah you know, once you look i mean once you reach a certain point in terms of risk appetite <clears throat> right and you're above that you need to use the, the native security controls and you never stop using them. But at a certain point, as you get below that risk appetite, and then you start to creep back up before you, or before you start creeping back up, you could augment it to say, how do I make sure that I'm efficiently, consistently, and persistently using um, these tools at scale? And that's where something like Identity Cloud would come in to really help you harness the power of all these native tools and use them more appropriately at sort of enterprise grade and actually layer on top of as well some additional capabilities right around automation around centralization um, but you always want to use those csp native tools because they are going to deliver an enormous amount of value relative to um, uh, the risk that you will run within cloud uh, i think that's accurate yeah and then i think that also you want to focus on a single definition of good and this more focuses on the multi-cloud customers but you know when when you do embrace a you know amazon plus one or amazon plus two strategy defining your definition of good across those various clouds can be a pain point um and that's before you even pull developers in into the fray and so you're having to manage controls using these native services in two or three different locations as your security posture evolves and you add more and more items you want to check it can become a little bit burdensome in terms of maintenance and so this is where you can look at csp security tools um, to really help reduce the overall maintenance and the complexity of that unified definition of good uh, and then hopefully what you really want in a perfect world is pushing that down to you know downstream to create a better developer relationship so that your engineers like we spoke about before are aligning to that security posture as part of their build process and not hours or days after their applications and workloads get migrated into the cloud. Well, and with that, I just want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, hopefully this has been informative. Um, just a quick pitch on Divi Cloud. We protect cloud and container environments from misconfigurations, policy violations, threats, and identity access management challenges across Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform and Alibaba Cloud, and then Kubernetes is an infrastructure layer across all of those. Um, you know, if you'd uh, would love to uh, speak with you more uh, at our booth, and uh, also you can see more helpful resources at divicloud.com slash black hat. And uh, we offer a free 30 day trial if you're interested in uh, full lifecycle cloud security. Uh, you can get that at divicloud.com slash free trial. Thanks so much for joining me, Chris. Thanks.